So today is our part three of our course, and I have a quick syllabus. I have a syllabus for you to look at very quickly because uh, we, we pretty much know how the class works. But if you go over to the network folder, um, onto my network folder drive there, and then go to my brand new folder, Campos Android 3, there's going to be two things. One is the syllabus, which you want to copy over, we'll look at briefly. And the other is what we're going to accomplish today, uh, this week. And this is, the, uh, this is the end result of the database that we're going towards. So if you'd like to go ahead a little bit, there's the end result. We're going to go to that result together. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So at the moment, just copy that syllabus over to your desktop. We'll take a quick look at it. And if you're a bit more advanced, you can copy that PouchDB example and start looking at it. We'll look at it together. But I'll open the syllabus. You can print it, of course, during the break. I'll have some handouts for you, of course, like I did on the previous month. Not as many, because I think the really hard part of just setup really required a lot of uh, handouts, which, which I'll provide some this semester, but not as necessary. So the syllabus, uh, boilerplate, this is part three. Our objectives are, um, we've taken our project from part one and part two. We're actually going to finish it and publish it. Uh, learning outcomes, add a database to the project. Sign and publish an optimized APK file. Set up Google Play Developer and, that uh, should be and or Amazon App Store development accounts. Create a store listing for your app and then publicize the app. So within the two weeks that we have, we'll we should be able to accomplish all of this, maybe a little light on the publicized part, but we will add the database, we will publish it officially, and that sort of thing. Um, there's a book in there that you might look into on the, on the third part of this three-part track, which is mobile app marketing and monetization. How to promote mobile apps like a pro. Learn how to promote and monetize your Android or iPhone app. Because you may develop an amazing app, Maybe you want to make a little money off of it. That book is about that. So whatever we can't cover regarding that is in a book. There's the, um, there's the calendar. So we've got to squeeze a lot of things into two weeks. So that's generally our plan there. And um, I forgot to put page three, but you are still bound by that boring sheet that said you will not do this and you will not do that, or you will be kicked out. Anyway, that's the syllabus. So the, uh, the main idea then that we're going to look at right now is using this PouchDB database. There's many ways to save a database or to create a database and to use a database. Well, if we back up, what's a database? What would you say, in your opinion, what's a database? It's like a storage. Storage. That, that, a data storage that, that holds um, data information. Definitely. So it's some sort of storage that holds data. It's a base for data, database. So um, there's many kinds of databases. Anyone know a few databases names? SQL Server. SQL Server, sure. Anything else? Access. Access, Microsoft Access. MySQL, MongoDB, PouchDB, etc., etc. In a sense, an Excel file can be a kind of a database, a really lame database, but a database. So it's just a way to store data. Well, what are some common actions that you do with a database? Make inquiries. Make inquiries, so you're pulling data out of it, right? Mm -hmm. If you're putting, pulling data, you're storing data, putting into it. So put data into it, take data out of it. Anything else, perhaps? Updating the data, yeah. exactly. Adding data, deleting data, updating data. That's what a database does. And then also, perhaps, the fourth aspect maybe is backing it up or replicating it or transferring it, that sort of thing. So we'll be able to do all of that. And as an example, very briefly here on the college's website, I'm interfacing with a database here. Uh, I could probably poke around a little bit and figure out what kind of database it is. But I'm accessing a database here, which is at the moment full of 1,047 classes that the college is offering. And I've pared down the information just by adding, uh, doing a query, searching something, Campos. And then it gave me 12 results, 12 records. 
and each one record could have a variety of fields attached. There's a field of the class name, the field of the class instructor, start date, end date, days that it needs, etc. So that one record, that one object, in a sense, has various properties, various fields to it. So we're going to do something like this. We're going to be able to create a database, add records to the database that can have multiple fields, pull the data out of it when we need it, sort it, because right here I can click start date and then it'll organize by when it start when the classes start. I can't edit this. I don't have that administrative access, but I can retrieve it. I also cannot add to it. We'll be able to do that. And so whatever database this is, it performs those functions and I'm sure someone is in charge of backing it up and all of that in case it crashes. So we're going to create a database. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to use, on the very last day of class, I mentioned a database. Does anyone remember what that database was? PouchDB. So let's open up your web browser and let's go to PouchDB.com. If you have any experience in databases, you know that there's a kind of database called a relational database where tables are related to each other where this might be a table called users and a table called passwords and they are related to each other so all of the usernames are in the table are in the document so to speak users and all the passwords are in the table or document passwords and they're related to each other so that that username goes with that password relational database. Relational databases that exist and are pretty famous are SQL, MySQL, a bunch of others access. Uh, but there's a newer generation of databases which they call themselves NoSQL databases. Databases that are not tied to that original paradigm uh, because sometimes it might not be exactly what we need for web apps. So in the evolution of, of mobile apps, people have tried to shoehorn the traditional type of database into a mobile app. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't, and it's complicated. So this new generation of NoSQL databases has emerged in the last few years. PouchDB is one of those. So it's not like the standard traditional kind of database that is a relational in that this file is connected to that file. This table is connected to that table. It's all on one big file, one big table, so to speak. Um, but it can have multiple fields, like I said a moment ago, um, and you can add to it, you can delete from it, you can update it, you can uh, back it up, duplicate it, replicate it. So it has all of the functions that we're going to need. And again, if you're used to a different kind of database, you'll find familiar things. And you'll find new things, and you'll find things that you may like or may not like. But if you're brand new to this, and, and you don't know any other examples of databases, then this, is, this might be the perfect solution for you. Or at a certain point, you might realize it's a bit limited. Who knows? But this is a very cool, very powerful, very mature project. It's an open source project, as many things are nowadays. Um, it's related to, a, to the Apache Foundation, just like Cordova. And so it's a big project that people contribute to and keep improving. Version 4.0 just came out uh, like literally 28 hours ago. I looked it up. They were using version 3.6 or something, 3.8, just, just two days ago. And now uh, it's up to version 4. So when I was te I've been teaching this class for a few years now, and, I and I've seen it evolve and get better and more powerful and such. Um, but this is what we're going to be working with. The great thing is that all the documentation is, um, is on this site here. We'll be referring to it as necessary. But the way this will work is, again, I've got the example project that we're going to end up with in the network folder if you want to start to look at it yourself. But I'm going to go step by step to create this project where we'll create a database, uh, we'll set up what kind of fields we'll use, we'll add to it, we'll delete it, we'll display it, all of that stuff. And it's all going to be through JavaScript. That's one of the big pluses also of using something like PouchDB in that it's JavaScript. And behind the scenes it does its special database stuff. 
So if you were going to use something like MySQL or other advanced databases like that, we'd have to spend you know, several months just to learn how that works and then integrate it into our app. Well, here we're going to use um, JavaScript, very familiar things that we've done before, and uh, get up and running pretty fast. So if you'd like to learn on your own, you would go to pouchdb.com, go through the guides or learn, and they step you through it really well to teach you how it all works. Uh, very briefly, I'm going to look at something and then we'll get right to it. If you want to go over to the API screen, the API here basically tells you every possible command that you can run with PouchDB. You get an overview. PouchDB is an asynchronous API supporting both callbacks and promises. Most of the API is exposed as some name of some database, oftentimes just db dot some method, do something, and with some arguments, comma, some options, comma, and a callback. So some command upon the database, perhaps with some arguments or options uh, or parameters, with extra options, and then some end result, often a, an error or a result, a positive or a negative result. So we'll often be writing commands very generically in that syntax. So for example, create a database. Our very first command, we would write new pouch db, that's the reserved command, and then technically the name of the database and options are optional. We would want to add them. And then there's a deeper example over here. A variable is created called db, filled with the object new pouch db and an internal name. It could be internal to your app, the, the database creation, or it could be on a server. So we can actually interface with a server that is running CouchDB. Our server is running CouchDB where we then use PouchDB to save our data on a server. And um, there's some stuff in the background, setting uh, memory and such, other options, pretty powerful. Um, deleting a database, db.destroy. We deleted the database. Um, putting a record into the database, db.put. With a variety then of options and parameters and such, so putting data into the database. And then that will give us examples. Updating it's in there too. We've got put and post, there's a big difference, we'll see why. Fetching it, so taking data out of the database, db.get. So put and get destroy, etc. So all the documentation is here, pretty straightforward. Some good examples. Um, but the way that we will do this, uh, the way that we have access to this is simply to add a reference to one file. Let's see, does it say it over here on learn? How do you install this? How do you add this to your project? over on the Learn screen. PouchDB is an in-browser database that allows applications to save data locally so that users can enjoy all the features of an app even when they're offline. Plus the data is synchronized between clients so users can stay up to date wherever they go. So the data doesn't have to live just in your one device, it could transfer from device to device if you have a cloud infrastructure in the middle. Uh, PouchDB is related, is, uh, runs on Node.js, uh, it's open source, etc. How do you actually add it to your project? One very easy way. We put a reference in our HTML file script, source equals pouchdb.js. That requires that what we'll do in a moment is we'll download the, J the PouchDB JavaScript file, and then we add that one line to our document, and now we have PouchDB. That's it. We have a database, and we can add to it, delete it, and so forth. So, at the very top right, you should always see then the download button. Go ahead and click download version 4. I believe this should download, this should save to your desktop. 
And what we're going to do just to focus on this brand new thing, we're not going to add this to our project yet. We're going to create a brand new basic empty HTML file just so that we learn about putting stuff in the database, taking stuff out, modifying, that sort of thing. We will actually then create the functionality that I want for this app, but in a separate complete HTML file. And then once that's done and we kind of understand it, then we'll put it into our project. So go ahead and download it. Download it to my desktop right there. I'm going to, on my flash drive, you can do this on your flash drive or keep it on our computer. On my flash drive, I'm going to uh, create a folder on my flash drive just called uh, Learning Pouch. Doesn't really matter, but I'm, I'm creating a folder on my flash drive and I'm going to put that JavaScript file I just downloaded, pouchdb-4.0.0.min.js. I'm going to put that into that folder. Save that to your learning pouch folder, whatever folder you want to create. And then within your pro the, in today's project folder, you can right click new text document and we'll call this pouch test.html. And when it complains, just say yes. All we need to start using this database is the, is the database file, the database library, the JavaScript. Technically, we could look up the CDN for, the, for this, the URL, and we don't even have to download it. We could use the online version. But again, the problem with that is if the online version goes down, then your app no longer works. So we're downloading the JavaScript version into a new folder, make an HTML file. Yes. All right, let's let me check that out. Once you create that pouch HTML file, just open it in Notepad and write a very very basic HTML file. And then you get started. Sometimes so all you did was click on it and download it. I downloaded it and when I go to open it, yeah. you don't want to. You're not gonna. So again, we'll just focus on a very basic HTML file here so that we learn how this works. So we'll get a little practice again by writing a simple HTML file. Remember that, we haven't had to write a very basic one in a little while, but this should be familiar. Just write a basic thing like that.
So just a very, uh, very simple 10 lines, very simple HTML document, then you can save it and run it. Uh, one thing is that, um, the funny thing is that our um, Firefox, actually, and I'll remind us, Firefox has uh, a setting uh, that is a little too overzealous in that it, uh, it, our database will not work here because it actually forgets everything that we do. So when we're, when we're testing this, just for speed, when we're testing this, let's remember to test this in Chrome. Uh, that one seems to be fully set up that will do what we want. So you can save it and run this in, in Chrome, and then we'll, um, we'll proceed. But let's just set up a very basic project right here. All right, so we just need a very basic project like this. Now, as I said, we're going to use this uh, database to, uh, s we're going to save to this database, we're going to retrieve from it, we're going to delete from it. So in order for us to be able to save something to the database, in order for the user to be able to save something to the database, we need some input fields. The concept is, I uh, remember I showed last month, that um, we've got our app and a person will be able to save a list of classes that they want to take or have taken. So they're going to save a list of classes. The class is going to include a CRN number, an, an instructor's name, um, and uh, the subject of the class. You know, whatever fields we want to save. So we're going to save that. So that means we need, in, we need input fields. We need the user to be able to add those fields to get saved to the database. So within the body of our document, we're going to set up very, a very basic way to, to get, um, to get, in, to get inputs from the user. That's going to be known as a form, F-O-R-M, form. So we, um, we're going to use the form uh, tag. We haven't seen that before. Form is just um, a, a, one of the most basic ways to collect data. You're seeing a kind of a form when you're logging into a website. It might have username and password, and that's a form. Forms have been around a long time. Um, we're going to need to reference this via JavaScript, so we'll give it an ID. Giving things an ID is often the best way to access them via JavaScript, so we'll call that class form. This is a form for the classes we're going to save. So form and an ID. Now it has a name, so we can access it via JavaScript. We can add IDs to anything in our, in our project and therefore access them via JavaScript. So what I want to do is I want to collect three bits of data. CRN number and um, class title and instructor. We can of course make this stuff look much prettier than it'll look right now, but we're focusing more on the concept of pouch and the database than on looks. So we're going to collect those three bits of data. 
and the way we collect them is with input fields. So I'll back up here and type input. We have input fields. When you, uh, when you log into a website, there's a type of an input field that is one line of text. There's input fields that also allow you to write, like on comments, multiple lines. Technically, other input fields are like the uh, submit button or the radio buttons and such. So here we're going to say, well, what kind of input field? First of all, the input tag does not have a pair. So we, it's just one, one tag like that, but it does have parameters. We're going to say type. What kind of input is this? And it's text. This box will accept text. We could set it up so that it accepts numbers. Is it number or numbers? I forget. But we can have a box that will only accept numbers. Do you ever use an app that it wants you to fill in numbers and the only thing that shows up is the number pad, not the letters pad or the regular keyboard? Well, we can set our input field for the type of input that we're going to get. In our case, text, because our CRN is, is made up of numbers and text. And because I want to access it via JavaScript, we'll add an ID. We'll call this CRN field. We're going to do basically the same thing for the other ones. It's another input box of type text with a unique ID of class or we'll do a title, the class title field. Recall that the ID can be anything we want, but I'm going to use basically what the field is and that it is a field. That will help remind me when I'm looking at 200 lines of code, 2,000 lines of code, it might be easier for me to understand what my code is if I've named it a little obviously. Another input field. It's also text. Its ID will be instructor field. For the moment, let's save it and run it. Obviously, it's still going to look pretty bad. It's not complete at all. Let's just save it and run it to see if we're on the right track. Save it, and as I said, let's run it in Chrome. Firefox will work, but we have to remember to turn off an option, which is not on by default. They just turned it on for us here. But if we just go directly to Chrome, we avoid that little speed bump. Run launch Chrome. As I said, it's still not looking quite right. Leaking, leaking pouch, learning pouch. There's our input fields. Can type in here. Learning. Well, usually you type something and then you submit it. You press a button to make something happen. So next line. This one on its own will be an input, but this one is of type button. So now instead of it being an input box, it's a button. The te we can then say um, its value, which is the text that appears on screen, is add class. So the button text will be add class. We have an input item as a button with the text add class. Now if you save it and run it, you've got the three fields and the button. Nothing happens yet, of course. And at this point we should also, well, not quite yet. Anyway, if I check this if I check this it looks something like that add class still doesn't do anything we're getting there 
Well, in addition to adding a class, maybe I want to reset my fields. You often see that also, right? You're adding content, but do you want to start over? You want to reset it? So we can add an input of type reset and value of whatever we want. Clear, for example. That'll clear the fields. And there's many ways then to do this. Let's say our concept is um, I've got these input fields, a person fills them in and clicks add class. It gets saved to the database. Again, as I said on the previous class, computers are dumb. They only do what you tell them to do. At this point, this would sort of technically work in that I could add stuff to the database. But then technically, I might not actually be showing my classes. So just to make it obvious, we will also have a button to show the classes. Every class that I've saved, show it to me. So we'll have another input of type button. So another button to click on, and its value, the text, will be show classes. I want to show the classes that I've saved so far. And that means I want a placeholder on screen that will then fill with my classes. So after the form uh, line 17, we'll create a div. The div does have the pair. This is our placeholder, and all the classes will show up here. Well, in order for us to do that, it needs an ID. We'll call it the result. So the result of adding a class or deleting a class, the, the, the table of classes, the list of classes, will show up in this div, this placeholder. So here's what I've got so far. Again, things are running into each other. It doesn't look that nice. We're not worried about that just yet. So let's say I'm adding, so this particular class in the real world is 1863C with, and this is Android 3, and with Instructor Campos. And then in theory is I, a, a student would fill that in and click Add Class. That would get added to the database. Those three fields would get added as one record. Um, uh, we'll press a button to show them and all classes will show up. This clear at the moment just clears out these fields. It doesn't actually clear what's in the database yet. That's a little later. But this is my concept. So hopefully it kind of looks like this. It doesn't work yet, of course. We're not there yet. But it should look something like that and there's my code so far. Is everyone on track? Does anyone need a little help? So I'm looking in um, Couch TV for references as far as how you know um, what to put, like button and reset and all that, and type. How do you know that, or text, I mean, how do you know that that's the code to do for what you want to do? Where do you find that information? Is it this, this stuff right here is basic HTML stuff. Okay. Um, this has been there probably since HTML 1.0, a way for someone to, um, to request information, a website that needs to log in and such. How would I know which of these to use? Um, we can easily look up input, H the HTML input tag, and what types do we have? Because as I said, there's also the type, I believe it's just called type number. And then that way, what you'll only get are the numbers and not letters. Um, so that's HTML. It's not exactly related to pouch. It's separate from pouch. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so in order to start using pouch, we need to add up on the head section, we need to add a reference to using to being able to use pouch. So I'll go back to line six. In my in my folder, in my folder, I've got that pouch test HTML file and the file pouch db. So in line six, we're going to write the script tag. We're going to write the script tag, and that does have a pair. Nothing within the tags, however. We're going to add a source parameter, src equals. And we're going to fill it with the name of that JavaScript file, that library. That file has all of the definition of how PouchDB works. We never have to crack that open and do anything with it. It's going to be a black box. We just know, we just have to learn the commands put, post, um, destroy, etc. We don't need to know how that file works, we just need to know how to use it for what we want. And we download it over on pouchdb.com, of course. As this stuff updates, then you would download the newer version and change that, and then you have the newest version of Pouch. That's it. So in theory now, right here, we have a database. That's it. We have the ability to use a database. Um, and it's all going to run through JavaScript. So after line 6, give yourself a new line. We'll add another script tag. This time I'll break it up into a couple of lines because what we're going to write here is some inline JavaScript. This is going to be JavaScript that will only apply to this file. That's okay because we're learning how it works. And then we'll actually put it in our, remember, kodika.extra.js. We'll put it in there eventually so that uh, then we can use this code universally throughout our app. For the moment, we'll just keep it within this one file. So everything we're writing inside of the script tags will be JavaScript. And if we look through the documentation, we see the very first thing we need to do is actually create the database file. So that's going to be uh, var, the name of a database, any name we want, but oftentimes it's just db equals We've created a variable called db, which that variable will store all of our data of the database. And we will fill it with new pouch, capital P, pouch, capital db, open close parenthesis, semicolon. This is the actual pouch db command that actually creates the, the database, new database but it would just kind of go away if we don't store it somewhere. So we're storing it in this variable. And pouchdb is a reserved command that only works and makes sense if we've got line 6. If we don't have line 6, this will not work at all. Everything we're about to do will not work. We need line 6. And technically here we've created a database, but I want to create it and actually give it a name internally. So inside of the parentheses and quotes, we'll give this a name of our database, which we don't really access that often, but I'll be SDCE classes. So internally the database is called SDCE classes. It's being stored in the variable db, and therefore we can quickly run commands attaching to that variable. Next line. <clears throat> what I want to do is uh, accept users' input. They typed in those fields, they click add classes, and I want to capture that. So we're going to do that via a function. Because a function is very useful to do multiple steps with one click and we will call this function add classes. Add classes does not exist as a as a um, reserve JavaScript command or a pouchdb command. We are making this up. Add classes. 
open close curly uh, open close parentheses and then open close curly brace inside the function I'm going to create three variables these are variables that we are then populating with whatever the person typed in those boxes so these variables we will call class CRM uh, and another variable. I didn't put a semicolon, I know, but I'm just uh, doing something quickly here. Next line, another variable called class title, and another one called class instructor. I'm going to create the variables and at the same time capture what the person wrote in those input boxes. So further equals I want to see what did someone write in that um, in that CRN box. Since we're not using jQuery at the moment, we have to write it the long way. So that would be document dot get element by ID. Remember that. Open close parentheses quotes CRN field. So I'm saying. There's an element on the screen called CRN field, right there. Someone typed something into it. Someone changed its, uh, its value. So at the end, dot value, semicolon. Someone typed something, a value, text or numbers, into this input field called CRN field. Right there. Let's get it, and let's put it in this variable, class CRN. I'm going to do the exact same thing for title. Document.get element by ID. Remember, ID is tricky. It's only capital I, not capital ID. Open close parentheses, quotes. Which one do we mean? We mean instructor field. Uh, well, it doesn't matter if I stick with this, but yeah, let's keep it let's keep it consistent. Title field. That's the second item. Dot value. And then you can you can see where we're going with the third one. So whatever value someone typed into the title field, title field, let's put it into the class title. There. Next line. Whatever value someone types into the instructor field, get it and put it into a class instructor variable. Document.get element by ID, which ID instructor field dot value. Don't forget the dot value at the end. That actually grabs whatever someone wrote into those fields to put into the variable. To see if we're on the right track, we will do a simple output to the console. So console.log want to display, uh, we'll do it like this, um, quotes, class, CRN, colon, space, plus, class, CRN. In the console, we're going to have it display class CRN is class CRN. Remember the plus is basically right on screen this thing and then that thing concatenation, just show these things next to each other. And I put a space there so that the class urine is not right up against the colon. We can string this all together on one line, but I'll do it on separate just for fun. And then another one, console.log. Next we're showing the um, uh, title. And then we're showing the console 
in the console who's showing the instructor. It's not going to appear on screen yet. We're still building to that. So yeah, we can run that all on one long line if we add a few more pluses. I'll just put it separate like that for the moment. The console log, remember, is part of our de uh, development tools in the web browser. It doesn't show up on screen. So the theory is someone types something to the boxes, they press add class, and then the console will show those classes in theory. Anyone see a possible thing that we're missing? We're going to capture that information and show it on uh, show it in the console. Well, we have a function that runs all of these commands. That's very useful. That's why we made a function. Is that enough of a hint? We're not storing it in a database. Yes. We created a function called add classes, but we never used it anywhere. Okay. So back down here. On our input add class, we've got a button, but it doesn't know to use the add class function. So we've got on click, this is line 25, on click add classes function. So up here I defined a function called add classes, but I never used it until now. So when you click the button, run that function, capture that data, show it on the console. I think at this point it's enough for us to actually test it. I'm going to save that and run it in Chrome, and before I type anything, I'm going to open the development tools. A quick shortcut in Chrome is to press F12 on the keyboard. So run it in Chrome, press F12, which is the same thing as right-click, inspect element. And open it in Chrome, press F12, and then um, we're looking at this stuff here. We want to look at the console. So it's actually hidden, perhaps. Mine's hidden because I've got a smaller screen. But mine is inside of that double arrow, and you can select console. So the point is now I have the console. Now I'm going to write something here CRN123 with class Android 1 with instructor Campos. Add class. And the console says, there's the number you wrote, there's the title you wrote, there's the instructor you wrote. So what if I write class 444555, and this is English, and this is instructor Smith, add class. Console then shows me my next ones. So let me go back to my code. How many of you uh, did it work like that? Right, good. Anyone need a little help? There's the code so far. Remember, spelling counts. Add classes and a capital C. Add classes, capital C. So check that first. You want to need a little help?
so we're getting there. We're capturing the data. It's being put into our console. I can verify that. Um, it hasn't been saving it to the database yet, however. And what I want is for all three of those fields to be connected together, to be related to each other. So what I want to do in the, in the nomenclature or the idiom or the schema of pouch is I want to put all of those three fields. It could be three fields, 30 fields, 300 fields. I want to put all of those together into one thing that they call a document. So when Pouch talks about a document, they're talking about one object, one thing that might have multiple fields. Just like, let's say, on my, you can think of uh, your driver's license. Your driver's license has your last name and your first name and your birth date and your address and all of that, home address. All of those are fields of one document. Your, your driver's license. And everyone's got a driver's license, probably. So then everyone has fields on their document of a driver's license. So I want to put all three of these fields that I'm capturing into one document. And we're going to be using basic JavaScript notation uh, known as JSON. J-S-O-N. Uh, what does it stand for again? JavaScript, uh, JavaScript object notation which is just basically putting all of these separate fields into one object. And it's not complicated at all. So we're going to um, continue on our code here. Line 17. We're going to create another variable. We'll call this a class. A class equals. And this we haven't seen before. Curly brace curly brace. We've seen curly braces as part of a function, definitely. We've never seen this, that we create a variable and equal it to a uh, curly brace pair. That's basically JSON. JSON or JSON, however you want to say it, J-S-O-N, JavaScript Object Notation. What we're saying here is that we're creating an object class, and it will have various fields such as the number of the class, the title of the class, and the instructor of the class. Those three elements are going to be saved to this one object, class. So we can reuse that over and over. If you have a little experience in HTML or other programming languages, you can kind of think of it like an array. But um, it has the difference in that it's got a key and a value pair, which we'll see right now. I'm going to divide this up actually into two lines, like that. Because I'm building up this object, and actually we should end, this, end the semicolon right there. That's one line. So I'm going to build this up into separate lines in here, just for readability. Every document that we save to PouchDB, at the least, needs one field, an ID, that makes that object unique from every other object, every other document that you're adding to the database. So we have to then write underscore ID colon space. This is required if we read the documentation. Every record, every document that we add to PouchDB has to have an ID. We can write one ourselves manually or we can have PouchDB write one for us. And if PouchDB chooses, it will write a, a, an ID that's like 12597428 XYZ, blah, blah, blah. So we are going to create our own ID so we can easily access it later. And we're going to base our ID on the class number. Only one class in the college has that number, so that's going to be unique enough. So we're going to say that the ID for this particular object is going to be based on the class CRN, which is defined right up here. Class CRN comes from someone typing in that CRN field. So the ID for that object is based on that. Comma. This is how you add another field. It's comma, enter, and then make up the name of the field. Here we're making up a name called title. Colon. And the title is made from class title which we've captured up on that line 11.
comma, enter, another field. We're also saving the instructor's name, so we can call it inst. I don't want to type instructor over and over, it's just inst, colon, class instructor. And that's the last field, I don't need anything extra. But this is then the definition of that object. This class has these three fields, ID, title, and inst. And they are populated from whatever someone types into the um, input boxes. So, just again to see if we're on the right track, next line, we'll do console.log, and we'll write a class. Save it and run it. Add some stuff to the fields, and we'll click Add Class, and see what you get in the console. Who else got that same uh, uncut reference error? Everyone. Okay. Let's see, line 18. So we did call it class CRN. We got an ID. Shouldn't really be. No, it's a bit optional at that point, but I added it. This might be something with the brand new shiny Pouch DB version 4.0 that I haven't learned yet. But it seemed to kind of work, except it didn't display that. I don't need to get that. There's <laughs> something like this before. What's that? Should this whole section be in the function? Uh, you know what, I think you're right. Um, yes, add class. Yes, okay, yes, good point. And that's all about uh, scope. Yeah. Uh, yes, very subtle. But actually, we should have been written that, writing that inside of the function. Yeah. Because when this was outside, we're trying to use the class CRN variable, but it doesn't exist, except for inside the function. We created the, fun we created the variable class CRN inside the function, so it's only usable in the function, technically. The scope of it is that it's in the function. Here, then, we're trying to do this operation outside of the function, but we have not defined class CRN. It only exists in the function. So I forgot about that, but very good point. That actually cut it and pasted it and put it in the function. Just for readability, I'll do it like that. So uh, make sure this whole var class stuff is in the function. I'm closing 
the closing uh, curly brace closes the whole function, and you've got a class. Now try that again. Let me check my console log. I'm going to add something. A uh, class is not defined. Oh, yes. What about the console log? Yes. Uh, right there. Yes. So we're also trying to show what appears on the console a class. And a class is defined in the function, not outside of it. That's why it's, a, I don't know what a class is. So another good eye there. Console log is also in that function. So I'll help people in just one moment. I'm just confirming that this works on my end. Um, if it works, it should give you something like this, where it still shows the previous outputs like that, but now it shows a brand new thing that says object with an ID of whatever you wrote in field 1, um, title whatever you wrote in field 2, and instructor whatever you wrote in field 3. So now all three of those things are defined in one object the object of a class, which is what we are saying here. So how many of you now did it work for? If you can, okay, anyone need a little help to get it to this point? doesn't know, that button doesn't know to use add classes because we haven't told the button to use add classes. So one of the last things that one of the things I added was if I click and it's going to say on oh, C L I C G. No thanks. Yes, no thanks. It's quotes. And then the name of the function, add classes. So yes. That one will have the open close parentheses. So now say that we well, got no reaction a moment ago because we never told to use this function and we click that button.
Right, so this, uh, we'll take a break very soon. I just want to do one or two more things. But we're still building ourselves up here. Uh, and this goes to show I did it on accident, but I could claim I did it on purpose. I put the, some of these things in the wrong spot, and then it said, I don't know what you're talking about. What's a class? Even though we clearly defined what it is. It said, I don't know what class ERN is, even though we clearly defined what it is. And that comes into the issue of, uh, of, of the scope of things. Creating a variable inside of a function only works in that function. So if you try to access it outside of the function, it doesn't know what that is. Wrong scope. So that's just something to keep track of. We could have created the variable outside of the function and used it in the function. That's allowed. If I created the variables outside and used them in the function, I can do that. But that pre presents other issues as well. This is one way to do it. It works so far, so we'll proceed. Uh, so right here, I just kind of proved that we created an object. That one object has three fields and a key-value pair. We name the field, that's the key, and then what's its value? Sim simply in the syntax. Uh, the name of the field, colon, what's in the field. And in these fields can be multiple, also multiple complex things. Like we could put in an object in an object. We're going to get crazy at some point, but we can do that. So that's enough there that that, that, that is um, um, saving uh, one particular uh, object to store multiple classes. Let's put it in the database, then we'll see the result, then we'll take a break. Uh, this function then has a little bit more that we want to do with it. Because we've created a, an object of class, we want to then put that into the, the database. So being careful here, new line 23, I'm still within the curly brace of the add classes. Now this is a perfect time for comments because you could give yourself a block comment on line 24 and of add classes function. To remind yourself, that curly brace is the end of my add classes function. Remember two slashes is a single line comment. That's gonna help me, it might help you. So it goes back there. two slashes, no spaces between the slashes. So further within the function of add classes, uh, now we'll actually put the data into the database. The database for quick reference is just db, because back on line uh, 8 we created the variable called database to store the database. And then we will attach various methods or, or, fun or commands. db. Uh, in our case, db.put, open close parentheses, semicolon. We're going to put something into the database. We're going to put this class. And we want to think about... We could easily just do a class like that. Put what this class is into the database. But remember, again, the quote about you can't make anything foolproof because there's so many ingenious fools. So we should actually also take advantage of what if there was a failure for some reason putting the data into the database? I want to deal with a failure. What if then there was a positive result of putting the data into the database? I want to deal with that. So then we have these callback functions. We have the ability to do something for a good result and something for a bad result. So in addition to trying to put this into the database, comma, I'm then going to divide this up into a couple of lines. This is optional, but it's, but it's allowed so that I can read it a little better. So I've divided up the um, parentheses into two lines. And I'm going to say inside of the two lines there, I'm going to say, well, don't forget this comma right here after class. I'm going to say function. Space callback. Open close parentheses. Open close curly brace. I'm trying to put in a record a document into the database. There could be a result, a callback, a result of trying to do that, either a positive or a negative result. 
So inside of my callback here, I could have an error, comma, or a result, a positive result. This, if we look at the documentation, is, is pretty standard what the documentation is saying. Maybe sometimes the names are changed. Maybe this function is called something else instead of callback. You can even omit it. You don't have to put a function name here. It could be an anonymous function. And oftentimes in the documentation, it could be called error or just ERR or, you know, yes, no, whatever. These names are arbitrary. The concept is, however, what's the result of trying to put an object into the database? Either an error or a positive result. Those curly braces then would deal with the positive result, the negative result. So I'm going to break that into a couple of lines. So notice again, when I teach this stuff, this is why I often put the pair of things on one line. Because if I were just to start to write like this, I would forget to close that pair. I closed it right away and then I divided it. Within that function, then I'm going to test uh, if there's an error. Um, or else there's no error. So we'll write here if, oops, if lowercase, open close parentheses, space curly brace, enter a couple of times, close curly brace. This is going to get a little confusing, so many similar looking things. Again, this is why I close the pair right away so that there's less ambiguity. Where does this belong to? What does that connect to? And of course, comments are useful. But this is if, open close, parentheses, open close, curly brace. I'm either going to get an error or I'm going to get the positive result. So actually, I'm going to continue here else, open curly brace, close curly brace. Again, what I'm checking for is there, if there's an error or not. So I'm going to uh, check this with that there's no error, that there's not an error. So exclamation point, error. The exclamation point means not. So we're checking here. We could also have done it with doing results, but we'll see what, just different ways to do it. Just to introduce the concept of not, because sometimes we want to check for the opposite. The opposite of having an error is not having an error, a result. But we're doing it this way for the moment. So if there's no error, that means we get the positive result, do something. Or else we did get an error, so show a negative result. And on screen, remember, we've got a placeholder, a div. And in that div, we'll make it say a message. So we'll say document dot get element by id the one called the result that's the id that is hanging out down there that is empty at the moment we're going to change what's inside that id with dot inner html equals and then whatever message we want in this case, we'll make it say class added. So if there's no error on screen, we'll say class added. Or else there must be an error, so then we'll make it say error. So in the elf in the else section, document dot get element by ID, which ID? The result. We can reuse it. Then we're saying dot inner HTML. We're changing the HTML inside of that div equals for it to say error. Make it big and scary. Error.
all of this that we've done is technically and is optional. Everything after this comma. You could have simply put the data into the database. Done. But it could have been bad data, it could be corrupted data, it, something could have gone wrong. So by having a function callback to deal with the error, or no error, we can have better user experience and data put into the database. Let's save it and run it at this point. The console should still behave the same, but now on screen you should get some text that appears at the bottom, very basically, but some text that appears that would say class added. Let's see, so I want to save it and refresh it. I'm going to add something here. One, two, three, Android 5, Smith, add class. My console stays the same, but now on screen, class added. I click clear. I'll try again. 777 Casino 101 with Instructor Jones. Add class, class added. There's my code so far. I'm going to save it and put it in the network folder. If you want to copy it at this point, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll keep building upon this. We're now able to capture data. We still have more to do with it. So it's 7.31. Let's take a break. We'll be back at 7.41, and we'll go on.